السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ الحمد للہ الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی سید الانبیاء والمرسلین صلی اللہ علیہ وعلى آلہ واصحابہ اجمعین اما بعد یقول اللہ تبارک و تعالی فی کلامه المجید بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم و اطیع اللہ و رسولہ و لا تنازعو فتفشلو و تذہب ریحکم و اصبرو ان اللہ مع الصابرین صدق اللہ العظیم رب شرح لی صدری و اسلی امری و احل العقدتا من لسانی یفقہ قولی My dear respected listeners With the end of 2017 Today being the last Friday of 2017 And we look at the situation of the Muslim Ummah Here and abroad and it looks, to be honest, pretty dark and gloomy. I don't think in the history of Islam in the last 1400 years have Muslims been going through such difficulties and such hardships on a global scale. What do I mean by global scale? No matter where you look in the Muslim world or in the West, here we've Islamophobia is on the rise. There's Muslim countries fighting with one another. There's civil war, social unrest, unstable governments, or there's financial crisis on a global scale. Before, you had Muslims in difficult circumstances. But if one region of the Muslim world was down, the other was thriving. For example, Muslims were being kicked out of Spain in 1492, in the 1400s. But here you had Constantinople was being conquered in 1453. Right? So on one hand you had a sad chapter of Islamic history, but on the other hand you had the banner of Islam rising in another region of the world. Today it seems on a global level Muslims are in, in difficulty. And that brings us to the question, why? Why? Let me narrate to you what happens, our first response. Before I narrate to you the, a, a story of a pious scholar, let me tell you what our common response is. Our common response is, oh, the, this is due to the enemies. Our enemies have brought us to this level. This is their cunningness. This is their deception. This is their interference in our affairs. There's two answers to this common response. Number one, what do you expect from an enemy? What do you expect from an enemy? What do you expect from the enemies of Islam? Their job is, by definition, to hurt you, to harm you. So it would be foolish it would be naive on our part to, any, to expect anything different from the enemies of Islam. Number two, no enemy, no matter how cunning, intelligent, how powerful he is, can make headway or gain any ground or harm you unless you yourself are weak. They will exploit the weakness of the Muslim Ummah. For example, if there is a burglar outside your home, a thug, no matter how strong he is, it's very difficult for him to come inside your home unless you allow him. Now, if you have allowed him, this gangster, this thug, 
to come inside your home and he damages your home and harms your family, then you have no one but yourself to blame because you allowed him to come inside. So you understand the common response that people give to the crisis the, the Muslim Ummah is facing? That, oh, this is due to our enemies. And what is the answer? I've given you two responses. Num number one, that is the job of an enemy. And number two, no enemy can make headway unless you allow him to. Now, let me narrate to you the story of Sheikh Al Hind. The title that is given to this scholar is Sheikh Al Hind, the Sheikh of all of Greater India. He was born in 1951, I'm sorry, 1851, and died in 1920. Of course, there are Mashaikh, mashallah, in in all Muslim regions, countries of the world. But I am more familiar with the Mashaikh from the subcontinent. So he was put into prison in Malta. Malta is an island off of the coast of Italy. And it was a British colony. And what the British Empire did during the 1800s and early 1900s is all their political prisoners who opposed their colonization were sent to Malta. Hmm? Were sent where? To Malta, this prison. So he's a Sire Malta, a prisoner of Malta, which they all wore this title with a badge of honor. Because being sent by the British to the Malta island was a badge of honor. You were a political prisoner. You opposed and fought against the occupation. You resisted the occupiers, the colonizers. He taught Quran and Sunnah all his life and spent four years in the prison in Malta. After coming out of prison of Malta and returning back to Hind, Sheikh Al Hind, Mahmud Al Hassan, Rahimahullah, gave his first speech. He's almost 80 years old now. And this is the first speech that he is giving in front of the general public and in front of the mashayikh, the big mashayikh e idam the great scholars of the subcontinent. It is that N Nelson Mandela moment. Imagine Nelson Mandela spending 27 years in prison and coming out. It was a very similar, just to give you a visualization. And people are wondering what is he going to say in this historic speech. Imagine 80 years of teaching Quran and Hadith, hmm? spending four years in the prison in Malta. He said that after teaching Quran and Sunnah and after spending time in solitude in my prison cell for the last four years, I have come to the cause the conclusion, the cause to the crisis of the Muslim Ummah, the decay, the decline in the Muslim Ummah, what is the cause behind it? He said the cause are two. Shaykh al-Hind rahimahullah said the cause are two. <coughs> Number one, the disunity of the Muslim Ummah. And number two, tark -e quran Abandonment of Quran. These are the two causes. If we look even today, he said this in the early 1900s, but even if we look today in 2017, we will come to the same conclusion that the cause behind the decline of the Muslim Ummah are these two. Disunity what, there will be differences. There will be differences in human beings, between believers and disbelievers, between Iman and Kufr, belief and disbelief, between Sunnah and Bid'ah, between Ilm, this Fiqh and that Fiqh, between Amal, practicing or non-practicing, <coughs> and between personalities. There's different types of differences 
all the differences cannot be lumped together. The difference between Iman and Kufr, Allah Azzawajal Himself says, Huwa alladhi khalaqakum. He is the one who has created you. Faminkum kafir wa minkum mu'min. Some of you are disbelievers and some of you are believers. This is a difference. This is the highest form of difference. The difference between Iman and Shirk. And then there's different types of differences. The lowest, probably the lowest form of difference is the difference in personality, mizaj. For example, one person is very grumpy, cannot take a joke. Hmm? Another person, he's very humorous, always kidding around, joking, laughing. Two different personalities. This is a difference also. Hmm? Do we treat all differences the same? When it comes to the difference between Iman and Shirk, belief and disbelief, we have teachings in Quran and Sunnah how to deal with this difference, what to do, how we should behave with the disbelievers. We have to treat them with mutual respect. This is the difference between Iman and Kufr. There is no bigger difference. And what are the teachings? What are the teachings of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? To treat them with mutual respect and to cooperate in areas of cooperation for the greater good of society. This is how to behave, how to interact with those with whom you have the highest level of khilaf, which is the khilaf between Iman and Kufr. My question to you, it's how do you think we're supposed to behave with one another and interact with one another with those with whom we have the lowest level of khilaf, which is a different type of personality? Do you see my question? With the highest level of khilaf is iman and kufr. And we are to cooperate in areas of mutual concern for the greater good of the community. There's other differences that fall under this, that fall below this. Those with whom we have a difference of sunnah and bid'ah, or a difference of fiqh, this fiqh versus this fiqh. You will find amongst the Sahaba Ikram Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een differences. But not one instance will you find where a Sahabi refused to pray behind another Sahabi because of some difference. Not one instance in the galaxy of Sahaba of 124,000 Sahaba will you find a single Sahabi who refused to pray behind another Sahabi because of some difference, even though they had differences amongst them. Differences between ilm and amal. So Shaykh al-Hind Mahmud al-Hasan rahimahullah mentioned two causes. One is the disunity and the second is our tark, abandonment. He used the word tark, abandoning the Quran. <laughs> Scholars later on commenting on this historical speech mentioned an important fact. They said, in reality, these two are one. These two causes are one. Because the disunity comes from the abandonment of the Quran. Quran is the source of unity. Huwa hablullahil mateen. When Quran says, فَأْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا Hold on to the rope of Allah strongly. That rope of Allah is what? That rope of Allah is the Quran. Hold on to that rope of Allah strongly. So 
Our distancing ourselves from the Quran is the cause of our disunity. These differences that exist, we have to see who the beneficiary is. Who is the beneficiary? Who benefits from the chaos and the differences and the infighting amongst ourselves? Detectives at a crime scene, they follow the, they follow the money trail. To find out who committed the crime, they have to follow the money trail because the motive behind the crime is usually money. They, fo they follow the money trail and they come up and they will come to the culprit who the culprit is, who the criminal is, who committed the murder. Who benefits from our differences? The non-Muslims. For example, amongst the Shia and the Sunni, there's 435 congressmen in the House. In the House of Representatives, how many members are there? 435. In the Senate, 100 senators. How many are in the lawmaking body? 535. Do the 535 members of Congress, do they care who is Shia and who is Sunni? Do they even know the difference who is Shia and who is Sunni? The 650 members of the British Parliament, MPs, do they care who is Shia and who is Sunni? All they intend is to create infighting, thereby weakening the Muslim Ummah. And when the Muslim Ummah is weak, they will be able to promote their agenda and pursue their interest. Who benefits? So where we have common goals, for example, even our, our, one of our biggest challenges is Islamophobia. We are partly at fault. Even for Islamophobia, yes. Because we as a Muslim Ummah in America do not join hands to fight Islamophobia. If we were to have a united front, because we have a common goal to fight Islamophobia, to take on the challenge, so we, as a whole, lose when we don't close our ranks. So the way to unity, the way, one and only, one and only way towards unity is to come to the Quran. Surah We ask for the straight path. In Surah Fatiha, we ask for the straight path. The first chapter out of 114 chapters. The remaining 113 chapters are an answer to that dua in the first chapter. You asked for Surat al-Mustaqim, here it is. Here it is, the remaining 113 chapters. So we have to come to, an, with the coming of the close of 2017, the end of 2017 and the beginning of 2018, even though it has been a rough year for Muslims. But we should not, we should not lose hope because losing hope is a sin. We cannot lose hope. There was the travel ban slash Muslim ban in 2017. There was a Muslim teenager on the East Coast who was raped and murdered and what to say about what is happening in many of the Muslim countries in the world. But it is not 2017. It is not. It is us. There's a hadith of Qudsi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has said that Allah azza wa jal has said la tasubbu dahar do not curse time. For inni ana dahar, because I am time. Allah Azza wa Jal says, do not curse time. Do not say 2017 was bad. Huh? Because I am time. 
It's not 2017 or 2016, it's us and the world at large. So we have to do what we can do. And that is, inshallah, to come closer to the Qur'an. We all make this intention, inshallah, that for 2018, we are going to make this our goal, our objective, our hadaf, our maqsad, that we are going to understand the Qur'an. Sahaba Ikram, Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, who were speakers of the Arabic language, not the Arabic slang of today, right? Call Halib, Laban and Laban Halib. No. It was the, they spoke classical Arabic. They spoke the Arabic of the Quran. And on top of that, they literally saw Wahi coming down, revelation. They saw Rasulullah blessed face changing colors when the Wahi was coming down. But they had to ask Nabi وسلم, for an explanation of, of a of this ayah, what is the meaning of this ayah, what is the meaning of this word. So how can we expect that we will understand the Quran without some help? So that's why inshallah we will make this our objective, our new year resolution, if that's what you would like to call it, that we will inshallah understand the Quran. Uh, and we will implement the Quran. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar.